guys, it's Chelsea from The Financial Diet. And this week's video is brought to you by ourselves. I wanted to talk to you guys really quickly uh, instead of a normal ad about uh, the very exciting thing that we're launching here at TFD, which is our all new Patreon. So we are expanding our membership, the Society at TFD, over to Patreon. If you are already a member on YouTube, you don't need to move over. It's not going anywhere. We're just expanding to Patreon with a few additional perks. We have two tiers where you can contribute at a seven or $12 level. You'll get ad-free bonus content, office hours with me, access to our book club, our community on Discord, where you can chat about money and other things, plus everything you see listed here. It's important for us as a company to be a self-sustaining machine so that we can continue to cover the topics that are important to us and speak candidly about the things that matter. And supporting us on Patreon is one way to help us do that. You're not just supporting us, you're also getting tons of awesome perks as well. So click the link in our description to join us on Patreon. And today I wanna to talk about a subject that I don't think has been discussed quite enough given how prevalent it is. If our upcoming members only video uh, about the girl boss had us millennials in a chokehold, the toxic myth of the trophy girlfriend has had a similar effect on Gen Z. And when we talk about the trophy girlfriend, we mean the stay-at-home queen who has time for a 30-minute skincare routine, a 10-minute journaling session, and endless smoothie making, and is currently busy strangling an entire generation of young women on places like TikTok. In fact, if you are a woman on TikTok between the ages of roughly 18 and 40, your For You page has more than likely been inundated with high-value dating and femininity coaches, day-in-the-life videos of stay-at-home girlfriends, soft life discourse, and just a general disdain for dealing with men who can't afford your rent. So how did we get here? What does it mean? And is a single income household even possible for any of us in 2023? So the newest iteration of Kept Womanhood first appeared on many people's radars in November 2022, when 25-year-old creator Kendall Kay went viral for a day-in-the-life TikTok about her routine as a self-proclaimed stay-at-home girlfriend. The stay-at-home girlfriend hashtag, which is now at over 204 million views, features videos similar to Kendall's, conventionally attractive 20-somethings making coffees for their boyfriends, smoothies for themselves, doing Pilates, and engaging in some light housework while they wait for their presumably wealthy boyfriends to finish working. These videos garnered criticism for being anti-feminist and for glorifying privileged white women opting out of labor that others don't have the option of delegating. And while the most viral of the stay-at-home girlfriends are generally white women, comparable lifestyle trends can be found in basically every community. The soft life movement, which emerged out of TikTok's Nigerian influencer community in 2021, doesn't explicitly discuss rich boyfriends, but similarly encourages participants to ditch society's hustle culture obsession in favor of a more meditative, peaceful, and stereotypically feminine lifestyle. And of course, as with many of these superficially liberatory movements, it initially started as a more overt critique of capitalism, with the entire soft life concept initially being sort of a rejection of the drive to to earn and view our prism through the lens of productivity. But ultimately, a lot of the content that's been created under this banner has come to be as mindlessly consumerist as the most toxic iterations of the stay-at-home girlfriend videos. We're talking about wearing luxury silk pajamas, sipping on an Erewhon smoothie that requires taking out a private loan, and moving around palatial homes that are paid for with question mark, question mark, question mark. And often creators and consumers of this content will intersect with what is referred to as high value dating. High value dating and hypergamy content are often produced by women of color and frame dating as a tool for both social mobility as well as love. And all of these movements generally have two things in common. One, divine feminine energy gender essentialism that declares work as inherently masculine. And two, a desire to decenter work in their daily lives. Now, even just with this superficial look at these social movements, we can see the ways in which the soft life, stay at home girlfriend, high value dating concepts are a bit of a backlash to what, again, many of us millennials were saddled with in our own 20s. The idea that it's aspirational for women to work themselves to the bone so that they have a shot at an executive job, in which case they can join the men in efficiently undermining and oppressing all of the other women who work for that organization. Again, see our upcoming video on women who girl bossed a little too close to the sun. But if it was a reaction to this girl bossification of every waking minute that struck the match, in many ways the pandemic definitely added kindling to these new movements. It's not a coincidence that the stay-at-home girlfriend first appeared on everyone's For You pages during the aftermath of the pandemic. The recession post-pandemic has been the first in history to affect women more than it has men, and industries dominated by women were hit the hardest by COVID shutdowns. 
School and daycare closings triggered a childcare shortage, and many women with children were forced back into the home as a result. The percentage of single-income families went from 29% in 2019 to 34% in 2020, which begs the question, was staying at home even a choice for some women or a pandemic necessity that never resolved itself in the aftermath? CEOs announced mass layoffs from the comfort of their summer homes while essential workers were expected to risk their lives for minimum wage. And without the distraction of workplace gossip or boozy office happy hours, many people realized that not only were their jobs pretty useless, but they were also extremely unfulfilling. And this collective disillusionment gave birth to the anti-work movement, quiet quitting, and eventually the Great Resignation itself, with 47.8 million people quitting their jobs in 2021 and 50.5 million people quitting their jobs in 2022. And the grievances that many people cite when talking about these labor force movements are pretty much verbatim the same ones that these women will often cite in their content when talking about why they want to opt out of working entirely. However, a key difference between these two iterations of the same backlash is that while the labor movement typically places the blame on capitalism, where it actually belongs, often the divine femininity crowd seems to place it on feminism. When trying to understand why the most educated group of women to date would even consider trophy wife as an option, we need to understand their mothers. The majority of millennial and Gen Z girls were raised by strong independent women who essentially had two jobs, an income earning nine to five and an unpaid position as a primary parent and domestic laborer. And though there has been more recognition for the unpaid labor of women in recent years, women are still more likely to do three times the amount of housework as their male partners. In a culture that expects women to be everything but ask for nothing, there is something that feels radical about asserting the right to relax. And it's also important to remember that with each subsequent generation of women, whether or not a woman has to work, especially while being a mother, has become less and less of an option. For millennial and Gen Z women, while their mothers may have viewed it as aspirational to enter the workforce, for a lot of us now it's the exact opposite because it's no longer something that we have to fight or even choose to do. And it's also important to note that many young women who today might idolize the concept of being a kept woman partially view it through that aspirational lens because they don't actually know what the reality of kept womanhood looks like. Even for our parents' generation, it was fairly rare to afford being able to be a stay-at-home mother in an affluent lifestyle. And unfortunately, the data surrounding single-income homes doesn't quite match the TikTok aesthetic. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the median income of families with one employed parent in 2019 was $38,259. Approximately 54% of single-income families receive some type of government assistance, and in the U.S., 23.7% of single-income families lived below the poverty level in 2019. And single-income homes with children are three times more likely to live in poverty as double-income families with children. The sobering truth for the stay-at-home girlfriend is that most single-earning households are struggling. And this doesn't even address the immense vulnerability that even affluent women find themselves in if 100% of their finances are taken care of, controlled and provided by the man in their life. Although sometimes the content can be cringy, when I'm watching this stuff, really all I can think of is how insanely vulnerable a position it is to be in to be a stay-at-home girlfriend. Like, there are problems with being totally financially dependent on another person, even in the case of marriage, which we'll get to, but having all of that dependence while not having any legal protections of marriage or civil partnership is crazy. Because while divesting from toxic hustle culture and embracing a more well-rounded identity outside of work is in many ways a good thing, abandoning financial independence altogether leaves women vulnerable to financial abuse. There are very few legal privileges given to unmarried stay-at-home partners, and additionally, opting out of the workforce for your 20s leaves gaps on a resume and skill sets underdeveloped, ensuring that it will be much more difficult to compete for jobs should you want or need to return to the workforce. And at a time when access to women's healthcare is less accessible and by default more expensive, it's incredibly unsafe for your finances to be entirely reliant on a partner's opinion of you. So if you are currently the non-earner in a single income household or thinking of becoming one or looking at all these videos and thinking that it looks pretty darn aspirational when compared to your day job, here are a few things you must do to protect yourself. One, do not quit your job without your own emergency fund. At the end of the day, having three to six months worth of living expenses that is not beholden to any partner's consent is non-negotiable. Two is to build your credit. Making sure your credit score is 700 or higher means that you're more likely to be approved for a line of credit or an apartment should the need arise. Number three is to continue to invest in your own education, like taking classes, working on creative projects, and continuing to network in an industry that interests you. These things don't require a job with an income, but can make a huge difference if you need to return to work. 
Similarly, four is volunteering. This isn't just personally fulfilling, but volunteering is also really important for developing skills and maintaining social networks that, again, could be really important if you need to work again down the line. Also, pass it on, girl, if you're just sitting around your house making smoothies, like, let's get given. Number five is to research cohabitation legal agreements in your state, because while you may not be guaranteed the legal protections of marriage or civil partnership, some states offer legally binding property agreements for couples who cohabitate. At the end of the day, neither the ultra girl bossification of the aughts and teens, nor the current backlash to women working at all because it conflicts with divine feminine energy is the right way forward. No one is inherently more or less adapted to work because of their gender. And the point is to have a healthy, sustainable, balanced, and fairly compensated approach to work for everyone, regardless of gender. Which is why it's so important to be part of labor movements, both in the work place and politically, even if you don't yourself happen to be working at that time. Opting out entirely and outsourcing 100% of your livelihood and safety to a man was not great back in the 1950s when women didn't have a choice except to do it, and it's still not great today. The truth is somewhere in the middle as it always is, and ultimately requires policy changes that no amount of TikToks about making smoothies in your pajamas is going to enact. And the time has come for this week's society questions, which as a reminder, all of our society members, and you can become one by hitting the join button or joining us on Patreon, get to ask me questions every month that I answer exclusively here on the Tuesday videos. Uh, I answer two a week, so let's jump into them. So this week's first question is, what are the best documentaries about money, finances, or economics? Gosh, I can't remember any documentaries that I've seen recently that I really love. Some of my favorite movies on the topic of um, economics are uh, The Smartest Guys in the Room about Enron, um, Margin Call is one of my all-time favorite movies about money or not. What is that one? The Big Short is really good at explaining a lot of financial concepts that a lot of people don't understand in an easy and fun way. Um, interestingly, 30 for 30, that documentary series on ESPN has done some really good ones about money and sports that I thought were really, really well done and fascinating. And I'm not a sports fan, but I really found them super engaging. There's a documentary called, I think, 750 Park, and it's about the wealthiest uh, zip code in the upper on the Upper East Side of the of Manhattan that is like under a mile from the poorest zip code, which is in the South Bronx. Um, that one is really fascinating about wealth inequality. Um, so those are just some of my recommendations. My question for Chelsea is what process tool or mindset slash reflection would you recommend to find financial balance when you are upwardly mobile and come from a working class background? I am starting to earn more and struggling with mindset versus numbers. My problem is how do you find the balance between using the money to enjoy your life more, for example, with more durable items and better travel and avoiding lifestyle creep as money with Katie says slash hedonistic adaptation. The goal is also to not live paycheck to paycheck as we all know. Yeah, I mean, I think basically a lot of people, and I would consider myself one of these people, find the most freedom in just having the pay yourself first method. You uh, determine your financial goals, you automate your savings and your investments and your allocations to things like debt payoff or, you know, again, investing, what have you. Um, and then whatever's left over is kind of yours to play with. And you sort of, you can work on growing that number, um, I, you know, whether by negotiating for a raise, changing employers, adding streams of income, what have you, but making sure that you're always just working with with the money that's left over after you have kind of done all of the quote unquote right things, because there ultimately is no one right or wrong amount that's okay to have fun with. But if you are thinking of your wealth building and debt payoff uh, goals first and deciding what's the right amount for you and then working backwards from there, I think it's a lot easier to find a healthy balance uh, that doesn't uh, come at the expense of what is ultimately the goal of long-term financial security. So I would recommend the pay yourself first method. As always, guys, thank you for watching and don't forget to hit the subscribe button and to come back every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday for new and awesome videos. Goodbye.